active or passive crossovers? Well, that question comes to us from Gavin in Taipei, Taiwan. And he said a friend of his invested uh, in uh, an astonishingly good active crossover system that bypassed the crossover inside of his speakers. And also, uh, he, he brought over a, a new power amplifier to uh, power up his three-way speakers, so he got three channels on that thing. And it's so good, so much more resolution, so much more dynamic. So why don't people do more active crossovers? Why are most speakers passive? I, I've talked about this before, but maybe it's worth going through again. As designers of speakers, of which I have, I dabble and certainly going to get a lot more into very shortly as PS Audio builds its own speakers, I got to tell you, in my heart, I love active crossovers active crossovers, uh, and so we should explain, the difference is uh, a passive crossover is a collection of capacitors, inductors, and resistors that are not something you plug into the wall. They are inside of a speaker and they are the dividing network for frequencies so that the tweeter only plays tweeting things and the woofer plays woofing things and the mid-range plays mid-range things. The opposite of that is an active crossover where amplifier and crossover are combined together. So all you do is feed it a signal from, say, your preamplifier or your CD player or whatever. So I think that most speaker designers, if you ask them honestly, would prefer to make active speakers. But active speakers have never sold. Active speakers take away the audiophile's choice in power amplification, takes away cable choices, relegates you to one sound, one type, that's it, this is all you get. Another, and that's why uh, I think new speakers don't uh, particularly go with active crossovers. Another reason is that aftermarket active crossovers, of which there are a few and what uh, Gavin is talking about. Problem with that is most people don't have a access directly to the drivers and circumventing the passive crossovers inside of the speaker. I mean, that, you literally have to go in with a pair of clippers and, and do that and clip out the, uh, the passive network if you're doing it right. The second reason is that even if you did all of that, I don't think most people realize how difficult it is to design a proper speaker crossover. These aren't just, I mean, a tweeter is usually pretty simple. Tweeters, you might have a, a, a capacitor or something a little fancier, so there we're okay. But when you start dealing with complex mid-ranges and, and woofer roll-offs and all that, uh, or, or take something like a, a Harbeth, I mean, there's like 30 or 40 components in a Harbeth crossover. That's tough stuff. That's years worth of work and experience and learning to do all of that. And for you to think that you can just simply whoop, 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 just hook all that up and make a great sounding stereo, well, maybe some people can, but most people can't. So in a practical sense, I don't think active crossovers, if they're external and aftermarket, are great ideas. For designers, I think they're terrific ideas that just the marketplace won't tolerate it too much. So here's the last thing I'll tell you on that. When we're designing our new speakers here at PS Audio, we will have an active subwoofer, servo controlled in every one of our speakers, at least the, the top three models. We'll also have a mid-bass coupler, which is the, the driver, probably a six and a half inch, that'll go between uh, the, the, the area of frequency after the woofer and before the mid-range and all of that will be active and amplified because that's the best way to do it and that's what we're going to do. So when you hook your amplifier up to this new loudspeaker from PS, you're going to amplify uh, or power the, the mid-range and tweeter but nothing else. And so we're moving closer towards that. All right, thanks. Bye.